Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. Let's talk about what matters the most. Just to read that title, probably got your gears turning in your head saying, what, what matters most? Well, let's look at some things. We will protect what matters the most. You know, people people might make a. I was just thinking about the making a garden, and they got kids around. They'll put a fence around it and and protect that. Depends on what what is what's the thing that matters the most in your life, because that's what you're going to protect. So, what matters the most in your life? Does your family matter the most? Does your belongings matter the most? I was thinking about that one when I typed that one in about people wanting to shoot somebody for stealing something. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, they should be arrested or whatever, you know, but do they deserve to die for stealing? Well, some people would say yes, indeed, because their material things matter the most. Does your life matter the most? It's amazing how we will protect our lives, you know. Once again, carry a gun in case somebody wants to shoot us. Well, if I die because somebody shoots me, I go to heaven. How about the things you believe in? Does that matter the most? Are you willing to die for what you believe? Hmm. You know, if what you believe in, in something in particular, you know, it's like all the religions that are out there in cults. You know, the Muslims believe in Allah, or the Buddhists believe in themselves becoming God. Different religions believe in different people. You know, we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as Christians. And many Christians died for their faith. So, are you willing to die for what you believe? The Bible tells us what we should be, what should be the most important thing to protect. Here in Proverbs 4.23, it says, Above everything else, God protect your heart. Everything you do comes from it. Now different translations say it's the source of all life. It springs forth from our hearts. And that's true. <clears throat> I'm going to pause on this for just a minute just to give you an understanding. You know, we should protect our heart. You see, my heart is where I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the most important person in my heart. And I would, I would die for Christ. At least I say that right now. Even Peter said that. I'll die for you. And then he, he denied him three times. But I believe that I could die for my Savior, my Lord. You know, after all these years of serving him. You know, I've been made fun of and laughed at. Um, <clears throat> people have called me legalistic and everything else because of my, my stand for Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so anyway... The scriptures tell us to protect our heart. So, and it says, everything you do comes come from it. It comes from your heart. You know, the Bible teaches us that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, which is where we believe and where we hope and so forth. This is where we go and do things. Uh, everything that we do and everything we buy and everything we, we decide to do, like if you decide to, to put a garden in your yard, that comes out of your heart. If you decide to go to grocery, that comes out of your heart. And if it doesn't come out of your heart and it comes out of your head, there's a good chance you're going to override it. Your head might, you might think, man, I've got to go to the grocery. And your heart will say, I don't feel like going right now. And so your heart really is determining if you're going to go to the grocery or not. It's determining that, you know, whatever you're going to do. You might say, man, I'd like to put in a nice garden in my yard and you break out of your head. And your head will you'll start thinking, oh man, that's a lot of work. Have to weed it, got to keep up with it, got to keep the animals and keep the kids out of it, and on and on it goes. And so it never happens because it didn't come out of your heart; it came out of your head. But when it comes out of your heart, that inspires you, motivates you. Everything that you believe in and everything that matters the most is coming out of your heart. And so here the scripture says, everything you do comes from it. It's the source of all the beginnings of your life. As I begin to do something, it begins in my heart. We will spend our entire life trying to protect all the important things in our lives, only to fail in the end. 
we can't be everywhere at, at the same time. You know, even, I was thinking, even a, a professional juggler, juggler can only juggle a few things. They might be able to juggle 10, 15, 20 things, I don't know. You know, maybe more than that. But they can't do more than that. You just don't have enough to do it. You don't have enough energy, enough space. You're not quick enough. And the fastest person in the world might be able to do 20 things. But he still cannot do uh, more than that. You know, so that's the idea. You know, if you about to go on vacation, you're not home protecting your house from thieves. You know, so you have to commit that to the Lord so that he says that you store your treasure in heaven so moth, rust, and thieves can't break through and steal. Or oh, they might break through and steal your material things, but because your heart's in heaven and your treasure's there, you know, you might be upset, you'll call the police to investigate, and they might even catch the thief, but you might not get your stuff back. But still in all, you know, you just got, you got all of what matters the most in heaven with the Lord. And so you can forgive that thief. As a Christian, you can. Some people, because that what matters the most is the stuff that they stole. That ring belonged to my great-grandmother. And that thief stole it, and now I can't get it back because he done, he done did something else with it and can't get that ring back. I hate that guy. You see, and this is not, you know... you. You got your, you know, your, what matters the most tied up into material things. Yeah, the ring is valuable, and yeah, it belongs to your great-grandmother, but is it worth a life? Well, let's talk about that this morning. What should, and I underlined it, what should matter the most in this life is eternal life. Not just eternal life for yourself, but eternal life for others. We're going to talk further about that as we get towards the end of the message. But let's talk about eternal life in your eternal life. What matters most in this life is eternal life. If you have eternal life in your heart, then that would be worth protecting. Interesting, you know? I mean, if where you're going to spend eternity matters the most, then you're going to protect that. Because if you don't protect it, you could wind up forsaking the Lord and turning away from Jesus and then wind up dying and going to hell. So if your eternal life is not the most valuable thing that's in your heart, you could fall away. I mean, I heard stories about people that guns held to their head, denied Christ. And they denied Christ and they were able to go live. They, could, they denied him and, and lost eternal life. Then, they, yeah, they could find it back. They could come back to the Lord and repent for doing that. And I understand that. But the idea is that some people have, have forsook, like, like Peter. He denied the Lord three times instead of dying with him. He repented of that. And then later, he, man, he was, got filled with the Holy Spirit and he was bold as a lion. He didn't mind going to prison, being beaten. Later on, he was crucified upside down. He didn't care. Nothing mattered anymore like that because what mattered the most was his relationship with Christ and the eternal life he had inside of his heart. You see, if, that, if you have eternal life in your heart, that is worth protecting. Don't let anyone come and beguile you, the scripture says, or come and deceive you. Jesus said in Matthew 24, deceivers are going to come and they're going to deceive many. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about in the end times, there's going to be a great falling away. Man, after 2,000 years, the Lord's about to come and people are falling away. That's just crazy to make it that far in history and for, and for Christians to come to Christ and then give up on the calling, give up on, on our profession of faith and lose our eternal life. <laughs> wow, what a thought. That is like the only thing worth protecting. Now, I'm going to show you why that's the only thing. And what can be done with that while you're here on this earth? Eternal life is the great is great treasure. And the word of God tells us to protect it. Now think about it. It's the most valuable thing. It's great treasure. It's more precious than silver, more, more pure than gold. You know, and more glorious than diamonds and rubies and precious stones. You know, some movie stars have 
uh, women have these necklaces that's worth millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they insure it for probably millions of dollars. But then they keep it in a safety deposit box in some, some bank that costs money to keep it there. And they wear a fake one. Because they can wear the fake one and people might look at it and they could say, I have the real one in the safe deposit box. They, it's so valuable that they wouldn't chance wearing it in public that someone might steal it from them. So it stays locked up in a box in a bank. You know, and that's how some things are with people. Is your Christian faith locked up in your heart? We'll talk about that in just a minute also. But eternal life is great treasure. You know, the prophet of man, the scripture says, to gain the whole world and lose his soul. Then it goes on to say, and what will he pay for that? You know, to have that. Well, the price was paid on Calvary. Jesus Christ died on the cross. His blood was more precious than, than wines and, and expensive drinks and all of that. His blood definitely is drink indeed, he said in John chapter 6. To drink his blood is to have his life in our veins. I'm not going to preach on that because there's a lot of truth in that. But I'm just telling you that if you have eternal life, you will thirst no more, he said. You will hunger no more because you have the fullness of something that's way more valuable. There's nothing. You can, uh, you can gain the whole world, it says. Every diamond, every precious stone, all the money on this planet, you own the whole planet and everything that's in it. And yet, you could die and lose your soul. You cannot take all of that and buy eternal life. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how simple it is. And you gain the riches of heaven. You know, what's, what's greater? The riches on earth or the riches in heaven, the one who created the earth? Hmm, that's something to think about. People were willing to, to kill over things on this earth. And Jesus created everything. So if I know the creator, I have access to everything. I, have, I might not be a millionaire with money in the bank, but I'm a millionaire as far as my, is what I know to be true. I have eternal life. My Jesus purchased it for me because I don't have enough money and I don't have a long enough life to pay for all my sins. He paid for them for me. That is eternal treasure. 2 Corinthians 4 says this, But we have this precious treasure, the good news about salvation, in unworthy earthen vessels. That's these, these vessels that are made out of mud. God formed Adam out of the dust and dirt of the ground. And then he put into him the soul and the spirit. So earthen vessels, it's talking about this body of human frailty. So that the grandeur and, and surpassing greatness of the power will be shown to be from God his sufficiency and not from ourselves. So look what it's saying. It's saying that God made us frail. We are, we are just frail. It doesn't take much for, for us to die. A heart attack, a bullet, in a car accident. You could die so easily. You can have a stroke. You can, many things could take you out. This pandemic. I know friends of mine have died of COVID. You know, and, and people died from, from other things like the flu. So many, so many things can kill us. And so the idea is that God put this, the Holy Spirit inside of us, saved our souls, put the power of God inside of us, a salvation, so that the world sees these frail bodies. We're aging, we're getting old. People are dying of old age, laying in nursing homes and everything. But the born again believer, no matter where they find themselves in life, they know that it's not anything we can do with this flesh body. But it's by believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So anything I do that's powerful, that touches hearts. You know, I do some of the most powerful messages God gives me. is done at funerals. You know, when someone has passed away. And the truth that God gives me to an audience of people always touches somebody, sometimes many, that's there. Because... They look at me and they say, look, he's just a person. How does he know all this truth? But you see, that's the Holy Spirit speaking through me. Not everybody there gets moved upon because someone's not going to listen to me. That's just the way it is. 
But that's all right. But the ones that will listen, they'll start to actually hear the voice of God speak through me. They hear my voice, but they don't realize that that's the voice of the Holy Spirit. That precious spirit, God himself, that's speaking through me and touching the lives at that funeral. You know, I preach messages all the time. I share in truth. I go on YouTube with these messages. And so few listen. You know, and, and, but the ones that do listen and they continue to listen, then they begin to hear the voice of God speaking through me. They don't realize it, but it's the voice of God. As long as I speak the truth, the Holy Spirit's voice speaks through me. Same thing with you. If you're born again, you've got great treasure. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And when you talk to your children, your grandchildren, you talk to your friends, people where you work, if you live in such a way that begins to make some of them listen to you. You know, if you live your whole life and only one person listens to you and comes to Christ, then you, then you have succeeded. Even if no one listens and you preach the truth, you succeeded. But just to win one soul is a great, great thing for God. The Bible tells us to protect the treasure of our hearts at all costs, even unto death. Now that's what it tells us to do, protect your heart. Yet, it also tells us to give it away. It's kind of like, you know, it's like a tug of war. Hold it and protect it, but then give it away. The more you give, the more you receive. You know, when someone, someone was to steal from me, I would be upset over that. It would bother me. But I would pray and I would say, Father, I forgive them, for they don't know what they do. They don't know that if they, could, if they would have asked me, I'd have given it to them. You know, if they break into my home and steal my stuff. You know, I would, if, if they really needed my stuff bad enough, I would say, take it, that's fine. You know, I mean, I got insurance, I got money, some money anyway, I can go buy a new television set. It's not worth a life. But if they would have just, you know, asked me, you know, if thieves not going to knock on the door and ask, can I have your television? But, it, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. But the, the thought is, is that I freely give what I can. You know, if somebody's hungry, I'm going to, I'll try to feed them. If they come to me and ask, you know, they don't have to steal my food. I'll, I'll try to feed them. I'll give them what I have in the pantry. You know, if there's money in my wallet, you know, if somebody held me up with a gun, I'd say, you don't need to hold me up with a gun. You evidently, you need this money pretty bad. And i give it to them. It's not worth a life. Because then I would pray for them. And I would begin to intercede for them. And so this is the idea the scriptures are saying. You know, here's the deal about eternal life in our heart. Every time you share it, it just returns back to you and you have more of it, more understanding. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here in Galatians 6, 7, it says, do not be deceived. Now that kind of a negative word, don't let anyone deceive you, that God is not mocked. Now that's a strong word. It means that, you know, if they're putting God down and everything, believe me, they're going to reap what they're sowing. But let's reverse this and let me talk to you today as a Christian. Don't be deceived. God is not going to be mocked by doubt and unbelief. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So if you freely receive from God the truth, the Bible says freely give. He sent out his disciples. He said, go, cast out devils, heal the sick, and do, the, and do these mighty works. And he said, freely you have received, he told them freely give. So the more that they gave out, the more that it came back in. And that was the idea right here. If you're going to sow and you sow money or you sow food or you sow time and you only give a little bit, then you're going to reap a little bit. If you've got a big field and you put one corn stalk, you might get three corns. But you have the potential of all the seeds that's in each one of those corns. So you might only get one stalk, but you could get many seeds. What will you do with it? But the idea here is that, see, there's abundance that God blesses us with. Some, and it just kind of makes it sound even. One seed gets one seed. But that's not the way it works with God. You see, if you give, even if it's a small amount, there's a harvest out there. But he, don't want, he doesn't want you to be deceived. He doesn't want you to limit God and limit yourself. Now, I'm not talking about money here. This is what everybody uses this for. 
And Paul was talking about money when he, when he told the Galatian church. But it's not just about money. It's about sowing of anything. So the eternal life that you have in it, you can sow that out into somebody's life. I can't save anyone, but I can talk to them about eternal life. The Bible says some people sow seed, and then somebody else comes along and waters that seed. But God gets the increase in that person's life. So we, we are seed sowers and waterers. That's what we do. But every time you sow seed into someone, whether it's money, whether it's food, whether it's a word from heaven, it doesn't matter what it is, there's going to be a return on it. You've got to understand that. This is what the scripture teaches. So he's saying, don't be deceived. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that your giving of time, money, and energy is of no value because he's a liar. And God's not going to be mocked by that devil. He's going to bless you. If you continued on in these scriptures, going into the next scripture, you know, it talks about don't be weary in well-doing. In due season, you're going to reap if you faint not. If you stick with that garden and you water it and you fertilize it and you keep the animals away and you are diligent, you're going to reap a benefit. You're going to reap a reward. So he's telling you, don't be deceived. Don't let the devil mock you and mock God and have you give up on doing good things. Continue to do them. They're going to, it, your, your blessing's going to come in. You know, I don't know how long it's going to take. Sometimes I've got things that I've done. I haven't gotten a return yet. They're saved for the right time. They will come. But I've had so many blessings come into my life. I remember after Hurricane Katrina, when it wiped out so many, so many states it hit. And here at this church, this was a post office. And, and we had nine feet, eight feet of water in it. My house had nine feet of water. The house I'm living in had 12 feet of water. You know, and when we bought and we got this post office after the church was completely destroyed, it had 30 feet of water that wiped that building out. And so here we are in this building now, twice the size. And the idea about how God began to bless us and began to give us things, sheetrock, the Lord gave us sheetrock for free. Lots of things we got for free. Monies came in by God. And I was praying one day in this building, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, you remember back in uh, 2001 when you fasted? And he reminded me of that fast. He said, this is the reward from it. Wow, I saw miracles. I saw monies come in and so forth. I fasted at that time frame. And here, back in 2001, it came in. All that, all that blessing came in in 2008, in 2009. So don't be looking for it every day. It says, cast your bread upon the water, it says, and it shall return on every wave. But don't stand there waiting for it to come back. Keep busy in your life. Keep giving. Keep, keep doing the will of God. Keep spending time with the Lord. It'll come back. It's a promise from God. So you may say, that your family matters the most. Well, this is good. But let me ask you this. Do you live in such a way that they will know what matters the most to you? You say that they matter the most. But are you living a way that matters the most? I'm talking about eternal life. Do you live in such a way around your family that they know that eternal life is what matters the most? That Jesus Christ matters the most in your heart? Or do you live where movies and, and games and things that you do, all of that matters the most and it gets lost. They don't see that Jesus matters the most. I think that's a very good question for us to examine our hearts. Romans 14, 13 says, So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. You know, think about that for a minute. You know, husband and wife, are y'all constantly arguing to each other? Are you constantly talking about, you know, false messages and things out there and condemning people and, and talking about the government and your children are hearing you all around you? That you start causing them to complain and gripe? Do you complain so much that other people around you they lose sight of your Christianity and they start to think in their brains, you know, they start thinking, hey, 
It's the Christian, and he, he complains about everything. Why become a Christian if I'm going to be troubled about everything on this earth like he is? You know, we're living in such a way in front of those that matter the most. We say it matters the most. My children, my wife, or your husband matters the most. But you spend time complaining and griping about that loved one, especially in front of your kids. You spend time, you know, tearing down instead of building up. You know, it's like Martha and Mary when, they, um, when Jesus came to their house. Mary sat down at the feet of Jesus while Martha was troubled. She was busy, busy, busy in the house, making sure everything was just right. So she got, but she, but it wasn't, you know, if she wanted to do that, that's fine. But it wasn't what she was doing that was fine in her own mind. She was mad because Mary wasn't helping. You know, a lot of times we do things and, and then we gripe about those that aren't helping us. You lose all your reward when you do that. So if that's what she wanted to do, that's fine. But when she came out and she wanted Jesus to rebuke Mary, he rebuked her instead. He said, Martha, you're troubled about so much. When Mary, she decided to take on the greater thing. Those dishes in there can wait. That house can wait. I'm not going to be here in this house with y'all you know, all day long and, and for days to come. So while I'm here, listen to what I'm saying. What I'm telling you is the truth. You see? And so the idea is that you got children and grandkids around. Believe me, their little ears are open. They're listening to what's going on. You know, we have to be careful that we don't cause them to stumble and become the things we're doing becoming a millstone around their little necks. Jesus so said, it would be better for you to throw yourself in the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. You know, so if they matter the most, then you need to be, be able to understand and, and, and know that everything you're saying, they're listening to. So talk about Jesus. Play games with them. Laugh. Have a good time. Ask them how they're doing if they're older kids. Find out about their lives. Be, be impressed when they do something good. Tell them. Praise them. And if they do something wrong, don't beat them down. Just say, you know, you're capable of doing much better than this. I've watched it. You've got talents and gifts. You can edify them and lift them up. If they really matter so much to you, if you're going to tell me your family comes first, and yet you're not bringing them to church to learn about God, and you're not teaching them about God yourself, whoa, shame on you. You really don't love them that much. We must live in such a way that those who matter most to Jesus will not stumble. You know, first off, I asked you as we started, you know, in this message about what matters the most to you. But you know, it comes a time in your life where you've got to start saying, what matters the most to Jesus? Did he die for the animals? Did he die for angels? No, he died for human beings. That is what matters the most to Jesus Christ, souls. If you, if you don't get anything out of this message this morning, then understand that it's really about what matters most in the heart of Jesus, more than what matters in your heart and my heart. But if, I, if Jesus matters the most in my heart, then what matters to him matters to me. Doesn't that make sense? 2 Corinthians 6 says this, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. Now the Paul's talking, and this is what he's saying about himself and the people like Timothy and Silas and the people that was with him. We love in such a way, we li I'm sorry, we live in such a way that no one will stumble because of us. And no one will find fault with our ministry. In everything we do, we show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure troubles and hardships and calamities of every kind. Now, they tried their best. They, lay, they lived in such a way. But yet, others still call, said Paul was in the flesh, said bad and evil things about him. Even Jesus, the Pharisees always put him down. You know, so he lived in such a way to prove he was the Messiah. Now, we need to live the best we can as Christians. But we're not always going to please people. So there's going to be somebody out there that will condemn us for what, we, what they see us do or how we act. They're looking at our flesh, and our flesh is going to do stupid things. 
But the idea here is that Paul was saying, doesn't matter what they say about me, I know I lived in such a way to not cause them to stumble. We have been beaten, been put in prison, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, endured sleepless nights, and gone without food. We prove ourselves by our purity, our understanding, our patience, our kindness, by the Holy Spirit within us, and by our sincere love. We faithfully preach the truth. God's power is working in us. We use the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and for attack in the left hand for defense. So we can look at this and we could we can plug ourselves into that. We can ask that question. You know, we got to watch what we're saying and how we say things. We're going to go through things, but we can't react to it. You know, if somebody calls me trash and then I get into this pulpit and I say something back about that person, well, that's going to get back to that person. I'm guilty of that. I have repented with the help of God. I have pushed through that kind of stuff and I'm dying out to self still daily in my life. I listen to what people say as they attack someone else and then I might say something like, you know, what you said was pretty harsh. You know, we, I think this, this thing you need to have a little bit more understanding. You've got to try to understand both sides. I'm not trying to, to, to attack you, but I know that I've been in the same boat. And I know that I just maybe just didn't understand why they said what they said. So, you know, there's a way in which to talk to people. Even though you might, you might have been attacked. We serve God whether people honor us or despise us, whether they slander us or praise us. We are honest, but they call us imposters. We are, ig we are ignored even though we are well known. We live close to death, but we are still alive. We have been beaten, but we have not been killed. Our hearts ache, but we always have joy. We are poor but we give spiritual riches to others. We own nothing, and yet we have everything. So this is really that whole explanation that I just mentioned to you. There's the right way to handle when people attack us. If they want to attack, nothing you can do about it. Don't attack back. Don't try to defend yourself. He just wrote about many things that happened in his life. He wasn't defending himself. He was just telling people, so that I can read this and see Paul went through the same thing. As I pass to this church, I've been through a lot of these same hurts. People have left this church and talked bad of me. And, I, and it comes back to my ears and I hear about it. And instead of being mad, even though my flesh gets mad, sometimes I complain to my wife about it. I try not to. And I'm getting, I think I'm getting better at it. But I learned how to pray for them. And I learned how to just say what Jesus said on that cross. Father, I forgive them. For they, know not, they don't know me. They don't know what they've done. Because they've judged themselves by judging me. You see, so I pray for them. If it comes back to my ears, I take offense. It bothers me and it's troubling. But I give it to the Lord and I pray for them. The best I can anyway. So in closing, I ask you again. What matters most to you? So after hearing this message, you might be quick to say, what Jesus, what matters to Jesus, that matters the most. But it's only because you know what I just said. But if that is true, you see it's in your head right now, I want to, I want to take care and matter, I want the things that matter the most to be with Jesus, what matters to Jesus most. Well, you can by wanting to, by trying, by, by talking to the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, help me to care about what matters most to Jesus. That's lost souls. Remind me to pray for them. Remind me to pray as I pass schools to pray for those students. Remind me when I see people in the hospital or whatever to keep me in that continuing prayer for people. To pray, to pray for my loved ones, but pray for people I don't even know. I see them on the streets. Pray for them as you pass. 
So in closing, I want to read this. This is in Colossians chapter 3 in the Amplified. If then you have been raised with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on things that are on the earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died, and your new real life is hidden with Christ and God. So Paul wrote this to the Colossians as they were going through different things, and he wrote this and he said, well, if you really are born again, then what matters the most should be the things that are in heaven, where you're going. You know, we are, you take care of your house, take care of your car, take care of your, of your grass and all that kind of stuff. But don't let that be your priorities. These things can be taken away. Taken away in an instant. And then one day you're going to die and you're going to stand before the Lord and the Lord's going to say, why did your lawn matter so much? You cared more about your, your lawn than the neighbors that live next door. You see, I fail the Lord by not praying for my neighbors all the time. We need to always be aware of the people around us. Then we might get the opportunity to say hello and to give them the gospel. Or go knock on their door and bring them a, a, a gift or something and, and break, open the door for, for a conversation. Just something that you might be able to do. But if none of those doors open for that, you can still pray for your neighbors. You can pray for them. So right now I want to pray for you. I want to ask God to, to, let, to examine and let you, help you to examine your heart and see what's in there that matters the most to you. So Father, I pray for these that are listening and watching right now. And I just pray for them in Jesus' name. Every day we have to examine our hearts. Every day we have to decide about what matters the most. What matters in your heart, Lord, should matter to us. You love our children and our grandchildren and our spouse more than we ever could love them. And if, we, and if we're loving them by caring for what matters to you the most, then we will love them the way you love them. And you'll take and fill in the gaps. If I'm only able to love them 60%, You'll give, us, you'll give me 40 and they will be loved 100%. That's pretty neat. So Lord, we just ask for your help. Help us to be like you. In Jesus' name, amen.